Hi, and welcome to Roger D's Rock and Roll History 101. Tonight's first episode will be about the Beatles, called The Beatles Down Under, Part 1, Let's Make a Deal. Back in 1964, I was a young boy, five years old. My father took me off to the Sheraton Hotel to see where the Beatles were staying. He put me high on his shoulder and I got to see where the Beatles were staying on the top floor. While they were waving and the girls were going hysterical, I was going, what the hell's happening? <laughs> it was quite amazing. And I, I was a fan from the moment on. I got to see Hard Day's Night and Help and all the films when they came out. And it was quite an exciting time for me and for Australia. Now, the Beatles Australian tour was largely forgotten by most of the media in the world, and I felt that we needed to really do something, so I spoke to my friend Glenn A. Baker, and we wrote a book together called The Beatles Down Under. Now, in The Beatles Down Under, we looked in depth to what actually happened in the tour. Now, I know I gave Paul McCartney a copy of the book myself, and I know that George Harrison had read the book. I'm not quite sure if Ringo or had read the book, and obviously John hadn't read the book because it was published long, about two years after he passed away. So, but I really felt that it really needed to um, be written down so people understood what happened. Now that book was published a long time ago, so I felt I needed to do something for the people now to, to re recap on what happens in the book and tell you the full story. So sit back and I'll tell you the whole story of what happened during, during 1964 when the Beatles toured Australia. Way back in 1963, Ken Brosniak who was born in 1913 in the Sydney suburb of Waverley. Although his family wanted him to be a lawyer, Ken was more interested in theatre and he was an inspiring playwright. He was working in the vaudeville circuit as an assistant from 1945, where he was helping backstage and helping out with promoting, and he learnt all the tricks of his trade at that stage. He had a long, long career and he had his own company eventually called Aztec Services. Now, Aztec Services was based in Melbourne and they arranged a number of concerts for international and local acts. Some of the international acts were Winifred Atwell, um, Gene Pitney, Marlena Dietrich, The Kinks, The Seekers, The Easy Beats, Pat Boone, Fabian, Sid James, Cilla Black, Dave Clark Five and Bob Dylan. So he was a very successful promoter as far as Australia was concerned. Now, he travelled to England in July 1963 to look for some new acts to tour Australia. Now, some of his friends in the industry, Dick Lane and Bruce Stewart, had mentioned to him there was a new act to look out for and they were called the Beatles. Now, Ken took a number of meetings with a whole lot of different promoters and while he was in London, he met with Cyril Berlin, an English promoter, and when Ken asked him for a list of acts, he was given a piece of scrap of paper with six names on it. Now, one of those names was the Beatles. Ken said he liked the sound of the Beatles and he would sign them. He was told it would cost him £1,000 per week and with that, they did a handshake deal on the spot. Now, the contract wouldn't be signed until December. And during those six months, between July and December 1963, Beatlemania exploded across England. Now, they had played in front of royalty for the Royal Variety performance, they had done a number of television shows and had done a local tour of England. And they had an, already a number of hits. Now, Brian Epstein was being offered $50,000 a show by an American promoter by December. Now, Ken was getting a little nervous and he had a some doubts that the Beatles would actually honour their contract that he had spoken of in July. So he contacted Brian Epstein and he spoke to his secretary. She told him he would be in contact with him the next day. And sure enough, Brian Epstein did contact him. Brian said to Ken, look, you might think I'm a bit cheeky, but I want £15,000 per week. I should imagine Ken was really very relieved. He went on to say, I made a deal 
and we're going to stick with it. The Beatles will come to Australia. And with that, the Beatles contract was signed on the 2nd of December 1963. The tickets for the show went on sale on Monday, April 13, 1964. Fans queued across Australia overnight to buy the tickets. Over 7,000 tickets were sold in that first morning. The evening newspapers across the country covered ticket sales with banner headlines like Beatle Frenzy. The fans were ecstatic. They were so happy to get those tickets. Uh, I imagine I, I, I would be too because I ended up doing the same for Paul McCartney. Now, although Ken's partners wanted to charge five pounds, around ten dollars, um, for the tickets, he insisted that they only charge one pound seventy-five shilling per ticket, which was around three dollars seventy-five. Considering at the time a weekly wage was around fifteen dollars, it still wasn't cheap. Now, Dick Lean was put in charge of the tour, and he was in charge of booking all the acts to support the Beatles. Now Johnny Chester was the first one to be booked. He was a Melbourne based rocker, he had wide appeal to the teenagers at the time and he'd already supported Connie Francis and Roy Orbison for Ken Brosniak. Now at the time Johnny Chester was a host on a television show called Teen Time and he had already had a long list of hits under his belt and he was also willing to accept £125 per week for the tour. Now, a Melbourne-based instrumental group called The Phantoms, now they were styled like, like The Shadows, with like Cliff Richards and The Shadows. They were chosen as the backing band for both Johnny Chester and Johnny Devlin. Now, Brosnack was informed that Mr Epstein would like a act that he just signed to NEMS to support the Beatles on this Australian tour. They were called Sounds Incorporated. Now the band was formed early in 1961 in Dartford, Kent and had gained a reputation in South of London for the fullness of their saxophone-led instrumental sound. In August 61, after Gene Vincent's band, the Blue Caps, had been denied permission to enter England to tour with him, Sounds Incorporated won the opportunity to back Gene Vincent on his British tour. Now this led to further opportunities for the band to support other American bands, including Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis, Brenda Lee and Sam Cooke. As far as record goes, the band only recorded one song for Parlophone, Mambango, Mam I think it was. Now that failed to achieve any success and then the band moved to Decca where they released a trio of singles, the last which was recorded with Joe Meek as a producer, again with very little success. However, while performing in Germany, they met and befriended the Beatles. Who wouldn't want friends like that? <laughs> they spoke to Brian Epstein and he signed them in 1963 to a man management deal. Now, they would later 
lend support to the Beatles on other tours, including their 1965 American tour, where they played at the at the concert at Shea Stadium. In that television program, you can actually see them performing a few songs. Now, they were a great live act, and I, I've seen a lot of their footage, and they, they certainly knew how to put together a good, fun act, and it was visually appealing. in the 60s even um, rock shows had um, a compare and they they had Alan Flea Field who was a British comic now he would also be the MC for the whole night the last sporting act to be signed was Johnny Devlin he was a New Zealand rocker from the 1950s and at the time in 63 was an A&R man for RCA records he called the promoters and asked to be placed on the tour Johnny had moved from New Zealand to Australia in 1959. In his own home country, he had already earned a gold record with his cover of Lloyd Price's Lordy Miss Crawley. And during his time in Australia, he had scored a number of top 40 hits. Accompanied by the Phantoms, here is the king of rock and roll in Australia, Johnny Devlin. Come on, everybody, clap your hands.
news about the tour came from England, telling us that the Beatles were going to bring some of their parents. Now, George was going to bring his parents, Ringo was going to bring his, and, and John was going to bring his auntie with him, and Paul was going to bring his father. Now, as the two came closer to being, um, uh, being here, the, um, that thing started to change. First thing was James Paul McCartney's father um, decided that he couldn't take the long 30-hour trip to come to Australia, and he decided not to come. And then George's parents, who had just recently returned from Montego Bay in Jamaica, decided that they'd already spent enough of George's money, and they decided they'd rather not go. Although George's father was quoted as saying, I could be really helpful on the tour, I could help with the fans, I'm sure I could take a bit of the weight off of George's shoulders, and he's got a lot to deal with, and so they all opted out. Now the only one who did end up coming to Australia was John's Auntie Mimi. Now apparently John's um, auntie had relatives in New Zealand, and so he asked her to join him. And next week, I'll be looking at, or the next episode, which might be next week, I'll be looking at when the Beatles finally started the first leg of their Australian tour. Until then, have a great day. Love and peace from Roger D.